Welcome to the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. We're going to take you through the key points of our paper in this week's cell on the structural basis for negative cooperativity in growth factor binding to an EGF receptor. Let me first introduce the team. This is Diego Alvarado, who's the first author on the paper and was a postdoc in the Lemon Laboratory. Diego is now at Coltan Pharmaceuticals, Inc. in New Haven, Connecticut. Second author on the paper was Dow Klein, who couldn't be with us today. He's now a postdoc in Steve Harrison's lab at Harvard Medical School. And I'm Mark Lemon. We've been working on the epidermal growth factor receptor, or EGFR, for quite some time now, trying to understand the detailed molecular basis for how it signals across membranes. You're probably aware that EGF receptor is implicated in quite a few different human cancers. And several agents that inhibit EGFR are already in clinical use in treat for treating cancer patients, including gefitinib, ilotinib, and cetuximab. Work that we and others had done in 2002-2003 uncovered some surprising aspects of human EGF receptor dimerization. We're looking here at just the extracellular regions. A series of crystal structures showed that ligand-induced dimerization involves a dramatic conformational change in the extracellular region. First, look at the dimer. Work from Tony Burgess, Tom Garrett and colleagues, plus Yuki Yokoyama's group showed that receptor dimerization involves only receptor-receptor contacts mostly driven by this green dimerization arm in what we call domain 2. Notice the two ligands are quite far apart here and certainly don't contribute to dimer interactions. Ligand binding takes this tethered structure and extends it, exposing the dimerization arm and allowing receptor dimerization to ensue. One of the big mysteries in understanding EGF signaling in a cellular context is the issue of high affinity and low affinity binding sites. Starting with work in the 1970s, it is well known that if you follow EGF binding to cells expressing its receptor, you see binding curves like this one. This is a scattered plot. If you plot binding data in this way for a simple case, you should get a straight line, and the slope of that line gives you the dissociation constant. However, in EGF binding studies, one always sees this curve. It's called a concave up curve because it appears concave if you look at it from above. This can signify the existence of multiple classes of binding site, and this is how it is typically viewed in the field. But there's only one type of receptor molecule, so this is hard to understand. Nonetheless, the nature of these high and low affinity EGF binding sites have been discussed a great deal in the field. They are thought to have different signaling potencies. Rather than assuming two frankly different classes of sites, an alternative explanation for the curvature in the sketched plots with no less functional significance is negative cooperativity. This is seen in insulin binding to its receptor, for example. Recently, work from Linda Pike's laboratory at Washington University suggested pretty strongly that this might be the real cause of the scattered plot in curvature in cells. The problem is that the structures published in 2002 and 2003 can't explain negative cooperativity, or two classes of sight for that matter. Here's the problem. The dimer structures Mark just told you about were symmetric, and everyone's biophysical studies of EGF-induced dimerization suggested that one ligand binds to one receptor, and that the receptor dimerizes only when two ligand receptors collide. You simply can't get negative cooperativity from this. For negative cooperativity to arise, binding of the first ligand to the dimer must reduce affinity for the second ligand. The only way this is possible is by forming a dimer like this, with ligand bound to just one of its two sites. We used X-ray crystallography to study ligand binding to the fly EGFR extracellular region. We grew crystals of the protein. We then mounted them right here. X-rays from the generator come through the crystal and are diffracted. Here's a diffraction pattern. We collect one of these for a bunch of different crystal orientations. From the intensity of these spots and their phases, we can calculate the electron density in the protein. This chicken wire-like density is then used to fit the protein model into it. Here's my structure. It's a dimer of the EGFR extracellular region, but only has one ligand bound. So what does this mean for EGF receptor? We have a model described in detail in the paper for how this works and how negative cooperativity arises. We start with receptor monomers, or maybe preformed dimers. As the last structure I mentioned shows, you only need to have one ligand bind to form the singly ligated dimer. We present some binding studies in the paper that also illustrate this. This dimer is asymmetric. When the growth factor binds, it pushes apart the two domains it contacts, domains 1 and 3. That causes a bend in domain 2 on the dimerization site, and if you zoom in, you see a pretty intimate interface in the top part of the structure. This is important. Think about getting a ligand bound to the right-hand side now. To do the same thing again and bend the right-hand domain 2, a large number of interactions need to be broken. That will cause quite a bit of energy that needs to be recovered from ligand binding. The consequence of this is that ligand binding to the right-hand site will have a significantly lower affinity than the first event because of all the extra work that needs to be done. That, in a nutshell, is the source of negative cooperativity. These structures argue that this would be the so-called high-affinity site leading to the singly ligated dimer. 
Low affinity binding would correspond to filling up the second site. These two species must have different signaling characteristics, perhaps with different dimerization strengths, lifetimes, etc. One particularly interesting possibility is that different EGF ligands selectively drive different dimers. The low affinity ligands, including ampyregulin, epigen, and epiregulin, would likely stop at the singly ligated dimer. The high affinity ligands, including EGF, transforming growth factor alpha, beta cellulin, and HBEGF, would stabilize the doubly ligated dimer when present at high concentrations. We suggest that this difference could explain observations of distinct signaling consequences for the particular ligands. It also has very interesting consequences for interpreting concentration gradients of EGFR ligands, which are important in developmental processes, particularly in the fly. The key now, given the structural framework we've described for negative cooperativity here, is to define fully the relationship between downstream signals and the different ligand-induced receptor dimer species.